but you know, I'm, I would need to. So the, the question is, uh, do you have to be at your optimum weight in order to be a candidate for a, a partial knee replacement? And the answer is you don't necessarily have to be at your optimum weight, but people who are very, very heavy may not be good candidates for the partial replacement. Um, there is relatively less known about that operation in very, very heavy patients, and I'm a little reluctant to do it in very, very heavy patients because it's a smaller implant and the amount of surface area that has cement on it is that much smaller. And so I'm concerned about the longer term uh, durability of the point of attachment to bone in patients who are very, very heavy. There are published data going up to 250 or 280 pounds, but I will typically cut it off well short of that. Other questions for Mr. Croy? Strengthening the knee muscles is, and the muscles around the knee is, is, is a great help for an arthritic knee, but I mean, if you've got bone on bone, pain, how's that going to help? I think that that's a, a good question and a good observation. All right, in general, muscle strengthening and conditioning, as I mentioned before, is good and helpful for many reasons. There are a few studies showing that the pain pattern uh, in arthritic knees is improved by, by improving the strength of the muscles around the knee, but I would say that in general, those studies probably apply best to, pati to patients with less arthritis rather than more. Patients who are in the condition that you described as bone on bone, in my experience, don't tend to get significant reductions in their pain by strengthening the muscles around the knee. Still good to strengthen them, may still make the recovery a bit easier. Uh, certainly, overall fitness is never a bad thing, but I don't think it's likely to change the pain pattern much in somebody who's in that bone on bone condition that you described. I think your intuitive observation there is right. Yes, ma'am. I've had a total hip replacement this February, and um, it looks like the other hip is starting to uh, wear down quite a bit, and I'd like to avoid the second surgery. Um, could you talk a little bit about glucosamine chondroitin and any research that might support um, maintaining the hip joint? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I'll repeat it in case anybody didn't hear it. Uh, it's whether uh, glucosamine and chondroitin is likely to preserve uh, a joint that's known to be arthritic. Is that a fair restatement of your question? Okay. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin are nutritional supplements. Glucosamine and chondroitin are components of your own cartilage, which is one of the reasons that people became interested in using them as supplements. They are nutritional supplements. They are not medications or pharmaceuticals, and so they're not regulated by the FDA, and that's something to know about them. Doesn't make them bad or good, just makes them what they are. Um, they have been actually pretty well studied. And what we know about them at this point uh, is the following. About two-thirds of patients who try them notice an improvement in their pain pattern. That two-thirds is better than the placebo arms of most of those studies where they've been compared. In other words, the studies compared glucosamine or chondroitin or both to placebo or sugar pill or pills with no active ingredients. And the people who took the supplement had a greater reduction in pain than the patients who took the placebo. So there seems to be some effect from these nutritional supplements. That said, there has been no reasonable evidence at this point to show that they regrow or refresh or renew the cartilage as some of the commercials say that they do. So they're doing something. We aren't sure what that something is, but that something does seem to be reducing the pain in about two-thirds of patients who are trying them. In terms of the specific question of whether they're preventing the arthritis from progressing or uh, maintaining that arthritic joint surface or the thickness of that cartilage, that seems not to be the case as far as we can tell at this time. There were some very preliminary animal studies that uh, suggested that there might be some preservation of cartilage. I would say those are not well validated and there's certainly nothing in humans to suggest that that's true. That said, if my patients could take something that would make, give them a two-thirds chance of feeling better, I think that's terrific, okay? And whether, whatever it's doing to the x-rays, I don't treat x-rays, I treat people. And if the patients are feeling better, I'm not so interested in if the x-rays are staying the same. As long as the patient's doing fine, I'm not going to do surgery uh, regardless almost of what the x-ray shows, uh, except in very rare circumstances. So I think it's, uh, it's a good option for many people. Uh, an additional benefit to them is they seem to have very few side effects uh, and very few risks of taking them. The disadvantages are that they're not regulated by the FDA. They're somewhat pricey and they're not typically covered by insurance. And um, because they're not, perhaps because they're not regulated by the FDA, you don't always know that what it says is on the bottle is actually in the pill. And from time to time, consumer reports and other groups will do uh, studies to, to try and validate what's, what's in the pill, if it's indeed what, what it says on the bottle or not. 
So they're reasonable for many people to try. They seem not to change what we call the natural history or the likelihood that the disease will progress, but they do seem to help many people who try them. Other questions for Mr. Croy? Okay, we can, I can take some more questions. I think there's still some time. I want to, before I do that, I just want to thank you. This thank is really you. wonderful. Okay, over here. I had two questions. Um, one was, do you, can you do partial replacements for kneecaps? And the second one is, is there an age limitation at which you won't do a, a re knee replacement? For example, I've been told that I'm too young and that my, the knee will, um, I might, if I have a knee replacement, that in 10 years I might have to have another one and the second one never works as well as the first one. Okay, two good questions. Um, is there a partial replacement for the kneecap? And I'll answer that one first. Um, there is. There is a partial replacement. It's not for the kneecap only. It's for what we call the patellofemoral joint, the joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. What we know about those is the following. There have been several uh, generations of that surgical technique. None of them to this point have worked particularly reliably. Um, the reasons for that are, are numerous, but at this point there isn't what I would consider a reliable patellofemoral replacement. There are ones that are FDA approved, there are ones that are in use, but they don't offer the same success rate as, believe it or not, doing a total knee replacement for isolated patellofemoral arthritis. This may change, and there may be particular patients where that doesn't apply, but for the general case, at this point, patellofemoral replacement or replacement of the kneecap and the mating surface on the femur is not a particularly reliable approach. The second operation is, is there an age, the second question is, is there an age limit to knee replacement? And there are no hard and fast rules, I wouldn't say, uh, but what I, I have this conversation very frequently, as you would imagine, um, as the boomers are aging, um, there are more people developing uh, arthritis. And the other thing that's feeding into this is, uh, is our problem with weight as a society tends to cause arthritis to, to present younger. That's obviously not the problem with the person speaking over there, but for other people it, it can cause it. Um, there are no hard and fast rules. What you need to look at is what's the likelihood of the knee to last a certain number of years. Uh, and so if you have a sense that a knee replacement will last Let's make it a round number, 90% chance that it's going to still be in service at 10 years. That means 10% of people who have that operation have been revised or reoperated in the first decade. Let's say that number goes to 25% by the end of the second decade. You know, so you're giving more of them back still in the second 10-year period. If you are 35 or 40 years old, getting a decade or even two decades doesn't sound like a real long time compared to if you're 75 years old when you start this. There's no way to, to make a generalization that's going to apply to every person in the room or every person in a practice. You just have to know that the younger you are, the greater the likelihood is that the operation is not going to last your lifetime and that you'll need to have it redone. What I would say is the more of those reoperations that you have, in general, the worse your prognosis is. The complications are more common in the reoperations, and the performance of the reoperations is often not as good as the first time joint replacement. This is so much the case that when I talk to my very young patients, my patients in their 40s, I will have a conversation with them that goes along the lines of, you're mortgaging your future against your present. We may be able to get you a good decade or two now, but it may be at the expense of something very, very bad that happens later on in life. For example, if you have a number of reoperations and one of them becomes infected or doesn't function mechanically well, you may look back and wonder if you couldn't have held off a couple of more years. So in general, for my very young patients, as long as you can hold off, it's better to. Yes, sir. Exactly. Terrific question. I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Um, is there any advantage to getting both knees done at the same time? I'm going to rephrase that question a little bit so I can uh, make it a bit more general. And that's, what are the pros and cons of doing the knees together on the same day? This is a, is a very common question since somewhere upwards of a third of patients or more have arthritis in both knees if they have it in one. And so there comes a decision, do you want to do them both the same day or do you want to have one done, recover from that, and come back at a later date, some months later usually, and get the second one done? Like everything else in life and in surgery, there are pros and cons to, to each approach. The advantages 
of doing both knees the same day are that you only go through the recovery once and that overall that recovery period is a bit shorter. You're, if, you're, if you're doing them both the same day, you're, you're recovering them in parallel. In other words, you're making progress at more or less the same rate so that at the end of that six week recovery period that we talked about earlier for knee replacement, instead of having just one done, they're both going along at pretty much the same rate, maybe a little slower, but not a lot slower. You're, you're mostly done and the whole thing's behind you. That's advantageous for people who want to get back to work. That's advantageous for people who don't want to take a large number of months to recuperate from having two surgeries staged several months apart. And it's advantageous, I think, for people who have emotional issues about surgery, who are concerned that if they do one, they may be so upset or traumatized or put off their game that they don't come back and get the second one done, and so they never realize the benefit that they could get from having them both done. The disadvantages of doing both knees the same day is that it's a much bigger operation. It's, you know, it's nearly twice as long if you're going to do them in sequence. Uh, and even if you do them simultaneously, in other words, if you've got a partner who's just as good at the operation as you are and you can do them together and you accept the risks of that, it's still a bigger hit physiologically. There, uh, this is quantified. In other words, we've got numbers on this. And what we know about it is, is the following. There's a much higher risk of needing blood transfusions if you get them both done the same day. There's a higher risk of cardiac or pulmonary complications if you get them both the same day. If those risks were doubled, well, we would say that's a push because you have to come back anyway. It's actually more than double. Not tremendously so, but noticeably more than double. And so what I tell patients about this is if they've got one of those reasons to get them both done, if they really, for social or personal or work reasons, um, don't want to take that kind of time to recover, and they don't mind some increase in the medical risk of surgery, then doing them both the same day may be reasonable, provided that they're fairly healthy. If the patient has a large number of medical problems uh, or says to me, I really want you to take the risk as close to zero as you can make it, I recommend separating the procedures by a few months. So there's pros and cons to each. I have that conversation with everybody who asks the question, and what do you think happens? About half the people go one way and about half the people go the other. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's almost a personality screen for people who are either risk averse or pain averse. I want to thank you guys for coming. I really enjoyed spending the time with you.